Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on this next broadcast. And I'm going to trust that I'll be brief with you during this time. And I want us to just look at 1 John and chapter 1, if we could. All right, 1 John chapter 1. And, uh, you know, I, I know that some of you are uh, being tried and tested during this time. And uh, they say that when you put a tea bag in cold water, you know what happens? Nothing. <laughs> but when you put a tea bag in hot water, everything that's inside of the tea bag comes out. <laughs> and I think that the Lord has used this time in our life to really reveal to us what's really inside of us. Are you filled with faith? Are you filled with fear? Are you filled with self? Are you filled with Jesus? And uh, while these things are bothering you, because I'm telling you right now, they're bothering me. There are things that I, I there, you know, in my life, I, I thought I was walking in the Spirit in strong ways. I thought that I had a close relationship with the Lord. And this particular time in my life has revealed to me that I need to get a little closer to Him. And maybe you do too. And so I want you to, I want to encourage you during this time to meditate on some of the things that I'm going to share with you so that while you're in this quarantine situation, you can kind of quarantine sin that might be in your life and uh, things that you might be struggling with. You see, God expects us to walk in the light, and that's what we learn about here in this passage. And I want us to look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Yeah. I want to just start there and just say this. I think it's really appropriate, everything that the Lord is doing right now. Um, there's, we, we live in a post-modern society, a post-truth society, where truth has been split into two parts. You have truth that's split into fact and then value. And when you do that, what's fact is what you can touch, taste, see, smell, hear. Value is morals, um, you know, uh, life, for example, male and female, Christianity, um, you know, uh, determining whether or not a child should die, whether it's okay to be homosexual, that's value. And fact is over here. That's what you can see, touch, taste, smell here. That's what you call the empirical. And when you split these two in half, you're going to have problems. That's why we see the fact, all right, if, if I can't see it, then I'm not going to believe it. All right, um, uh, you know, we can see that a child is, uh, that a, a, a child, uh, that life begins at conception. All right, no doctor's going to argue with you about that. However, uh, the doctor is going to say, but I don't value life until it's born. Some doctors go so far as to say, I don't value life until it's three years old. Now, if they can tinker with that side of life, what about the other side of life? What about the side when people are getting ready to pass on? Well, if we should be able to kill children, then we ought to be able to be allowed to kill old people too, depending on our value system. See, that's why it's dangerous to split truth in half. And uh, I think what God is doing right now is I think that he's giving everybody a glimpse of truth. I've never met, a, I heard somebody say, I've never met a, a I've never met a, an atheist in a foxhole. And the fact is, is during times of adversity, uh, you're going to see people looking more towards God than any other time. And right now, people are soft towards the God language. And it's important that we uphold truth during this time. Truth has fallen in the street, but if we uphold it, it won't be so anymore. And so I encourage you right now to think about truth. Think about the fact that truth is fact, what you can see, touch, taste, smell, and hear, the empirical. All right, truth is empirical and value combined. And can I tell you something? We're coming up on Easter. 
in April. I think we're still going to be under quarantine during Easter, during Resurrection Sunday. And do you know that our, our faith in Jesus Christ would never survive unless it were because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The Bible says our faith is in vain if Christ be not raised. And you see, Jesus Christ keeps truth together. And we see it right here in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. For the life, or he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Empirical. 500 brethren witnessed Jesus Christ alive at one time. Some of them were dead when Paul wrote it down, but some of them were still alive now. All of them are dead now. But at that particular time, there were some that were alive. And when Paul was writing, he said, go ask them. They saw him. Over 500 brethren at once. Now, you know, you go and, uh, you, you go and, and find out if uh, Joseph Smith actually saw the golden tablets, the golden plates. Well, uh, you know, apparently there were, there were two guys who actually claimed that they saw him. But now they deny that, that, that they saw, saw, that, that saw the golden plates with him. He had no witnesses. But Jesus Christ had over 500 witnesses at one time. Uh, when, when he rose from the dead. They saw him alive. It's a wonderful truth. And today we're getting ready to, we're get, we're, uh, in, our, in, our, in the next few weeks, we're getting ready to celebrate Easter during this time. The world is going to have a much clearer focus on the empty tomb. Isn't that wonderful? So going on in verse 2, it says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. I love that. That's one of my favorite verses. You know why? Because it says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we walk by faith and not by sight. And in order for me to find joy, I must look to the word of God. And I love how it says, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You know, Jesus said that when he was giving his last words to the disciples in the garden. He said, uh, he says, these things these, uh, uh, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He's the word of God. So these things are written to us, that we might have, that our joy might be full. In verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Bible says this in uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, why do I want to go to the Father? The Bible says in James chapter 1, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We want to get to the Father because he has everything we need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Bible says, because I'm with him, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I'll be a blessing to all those about me because I'm overflowing. My cup is running over with joy. And so I want to be able to walk in that light. And so I want us to look at what it says after that, all right? It says, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But... If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That verse right there is our key verse for today. But, let's look at it again. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us 
from all sin. Now, here's the question that I want to ask. It's easier said than done to walk in the light as he is in the light. Let's pray first. Lord, I do ask that you would just bless and just help as we look to your word. I pray that if there's anybody listening, I pray that if maybe just one person that's listening might be, might be reached through this message, that you would just use that person to walk by faith and seek to do your will uh, no matter what. And, and uh, perhaps maybe I'll never meet the person listening that you would change, but I trust that maybe somebody that's listening to this message might be helped and encouraged and strengthened through what is heard through the preaching of your word. And I thank you for it. I'm trusting you'll anoint these lips of clay and just help me as I do this. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ I ask all these things. Amen. All right, so if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You know, that's easier said than done. Have you ever wondered why such a truth is so hard to maintain? Why is it that it's so hard to walk in the light as he is in the light? Why is it that we end up stumbling in darkness all the time? You know, I mean, uh, physically, empirically, we've been talking about the empirical. Empirically, it's a lot easier to go into a room and turn on the light than it is to walk around in darkness. So why is it spiritually that we end up walking around in darkness instead of turning the light on? Well, first of all, let's discuss why we should walk in the light spiritually. Because things are described a little bit different in the spiritual realm. Because spiritual realm, the spiritual realm doesn't have color, doesn't have taste, doesn't have the empirical, as I had, meant, had been mentioning already, all right? When we walk in the light, we are able to enjoy fellowship with Jesus, all right? Now, 1 John, has, 1 John 1, 7 has been explained incorrectly, I think, a lot of times. A lot of people have said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And so they say that if we walk in the light of God, that we're going to have fellowship with the brethren. Now, he talks about the brethren later on in the scriptures, but that's not what he's talking about right here. He's saying if we, have, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship together. That means I have fellowship with God because I walk in the light even as he is in the light. I have fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I have fellowship with the God of lights where every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from. And so I can be sure that I'm going to have everything I need. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says that he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he said, I pray, I, the Bible says, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something. We say, uh, well, uh, spiritual blessings, that, uh, you know, that, 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 that's, that's good and everything, but it's kind of like Jimmy Stewart in the uh, movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you know. He said, uh, oh, you think you can fix my problems and you're an angel from heaven. You wouldn't happen to have 3,000 bucks on you, would you? And he goes, no, 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 we don't use money in heaven. And, and uh, Jimmy Stewart says, oh, well, it sure works, around, works pretty good down here, bub. <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, we, we think that uh, spiritually, you know, there's just not going to be a whole lot of things that are going to really meet our needs down here. But can I tell you something? That when we put our faith in what God's Word said and we are fed spiritually, it does affect us emotionally. When we choose to believe what's true, even though we don't feel like it, all right? He is our peace, the Bible says. You say, well, I don't feel like I have a whole lot of peace, so there, it doesn't work. Well, that's, that's not necessarily true. You gotta make sure. Uh, I like the way that uh, Evan Hopkins described it. He talked about three guys that follow one another. Mr. Feeling, or I'm sorry, Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. Mr. Feeling can never follow Mr. Fact because Mr. Feeling may not always feel joyful. The Bible says that uh, you have joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, the Bible says. The Bible says He is our peace. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Well, I feel kind of helpless right now during this quarantine, Pastor Mike. Did you notice I feel that way? You can walk into a room and say, I'm tired. And you know what? You're going to feel tired. Because those are your feelings. But if you choose to allow feeling to follow faith, things happen a little bit differently. Because, see, the Bible will say, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. 
And then it goes on and it says, now notice, all right, it says, and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. That's a physical blessing. That's saying that if I put my faith and trust in God's word and I believe what it says, I'm going to eventually start feeling it. And so you have three parts. You have Mr. Fact, which is the word of God, and Mr. Faith always follows Mr. Fact. Even though Mr. Feeling doesn't feel it, he's going to follow Mr. Faith. Mr. Faith says, I don't really feel very happy, but I'm going to choose to believe it anyway. And then guess what? Mr. Feeling is going to follow suit every time. So I want to just encourage you with that. And I want to help you a little bit further in order to walk in the light. It says this, Colossians 2, 6 says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. A lot of people overlook that verse. A lot of people overlook the profundity of that verse and what it actually means. Because the fact is, is we've got a lot of liberalism, or we've got a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of legalism out there, where we follow a list of rules that make us happy, and you know, and and, and it keeps us kind of, you know, uh, you know, as long as I as as long as I do this, and as long as I do this, as long as I do this, you know, I feel good about myself as far as my Christian faith. You know, we follow a list of rules, and that's about it. That would be that would be that that legalism. Now, I'm not saying that we should never follow what the Word of God says. I'm saying that. Uh, legalism where we follow a list of rules rather than having a relationship, there's a problem there, all right? Then you've got antinomianism or legalism or uh, liberalism, I mean, all right, which is basically the other side where we, where, where we feel like, well, you know what, God died for our sins and if we confess our, if we commit, if we commit sin, we just ask God to forgive us and then go off and mess up again and keep asking God to forgive us and, you know, oh, it's all right, you know, uh, you know grace is greater than sin. Well, there's a, there's a bad side to that too because how are we supposed to be lights in this world if we're going to keep walking in sin, all right? So uh, when we walk in Christ, all right, he says, as, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What happens when you do that? Well, let me explain this first, all right? It says, as you have received him. How do you receive him? By faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all about our faith and not what we do to get to heaven. It's about our faith and trust in him. He paid for everything. And so... Just like that faith that we put in Jesus, realizing there's nothing I can do to get to heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no way that I can ever attain to heaven. There's no way I'll ever get there. I'm trusting in Christ alone to help me. In that very same way, walk in Him. That means every decision, every step in life that I take today, I'm going to walk in Christ. I can't go through today without feeling depressed, Lord. I need you. I'm going to fail today. Uh, some of you are having to spend extra time with your spouse. And you're realizing, you know what? My relationship with my spouse is not as great as I thought it was. Uh, I found myself getting in arguments and all this stuff. And you need to get that straightened out. And you need to say, I'm going to walk in Christ. I can't do this without you, Lord. I'm going to fail. I'm going to be a lousy husband. I'm going to be a lousy wife unless I'm walking in you. I'm depending on you to help me with every step that I take. And he will. Now, how can you know that you are walking in him? Well, it says in Galatians 5.16, something very similar to walking in Christ. It says, this I say then, walk in the spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a comforter that's like me. And so it's, it's basically the same thing. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, we get a good little microscopic view of that. We get to see a little bit of, you know, how do we know that we're walking in the Spirit? You know, I like to know that. How do I know that my church is in revival? Well, the Bible has, has, has examples of that, all right? A lot of people think, well, I know that my church is in revival when I see fire come from heaven. 
Or I know that my church is in revival when I feel a quaking. No, those are incidentals of revival. I believe those things happened. I believe some amazing things have taken place in revivals. I think of the Asbury College revival in 1970, the most remarkable incident where the the revival took place on the campus and it filled a particular uh, chapel with the the presence and the, 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 the sweetness of God. And when you left that chapel area, it kind of left. And so people congregated and got together and met in that place. It was in that particular place that the manifestation of God was very real. And people would stay there for hours. You have other incidents where entire towns got saved. For example, Charles Finney during the Rochester Revival. Everybody in Rochester trusted Christ as their Savior. It was a most amazing event. But you can't always expect those things to happen in a revival. But you can expect, all right, you can expect essentials in revival. The Bible says remarkable answers to prayer. The Bible says that we can expect souls being saved. We can expect the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The obvious help of the Holy Spirit, where we seem to be getting along and and coming up with ideas, and, oh, I was just thinking about that the other day, and we all agree with one another, and and persecution is one of those um, uh, essentials of revival, where God uses sometimes persecution and other situations like the coronavirus to kind of get the church in line. I think the church has been seeking God out in tremendous ways, and I think that God is answering our prayers even now. But the fruit of the Spirit right here is another way that God says, here's how you know that you're walking in the Spirit. I like this, all right? And this is why I, 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 I was talking with my wife about this. I'm, a little, I'm, a, I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to how this verse is said. Because... It says this, the fruit of the Spirit, all right, let's, uh, let, let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll, we'll look at Galatians really quick, all right? Galatians chapter 5, and uh, we'll look at uh, verse 22 here, all right? Let's look at what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. <laughs> I said that kind of fast. But I want you to notice in particular at the very beginning, the fruit, fruit, not fruits of the Spirit, but fruit one. Now, there's a big reason why I say that, all right? If you're going to say fruits of the Spirit, that means that you've got different fruits. You can take an apple and say this is love. You can take an orange and say this is peace. And uh, you can take a peach and say this is uh, joy, all right? And so they're distinguished from one another, which means you can have one, but you may not have the other. That's not, that's not what it's saying at all. The fruit of the Spirit is the proof of the Spirit. It's proof that you're walking in the Spirit. How do I know I'm walking in the Spirit? When I love my enemies. How do I know I'm walking in the Spirit? When I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the midst of all these difficult things, I'm joyful. I just feel happy all the time. Peace. In the midst of these difficult times, I have peace. That's the fruit. You want to know how you're walking in the Spirit? Make sure you check your fruit. There's fruit in fear, you see. Fear has its own fruits. Selfishness, all right? Hatred. Leave me alone. You know, people who hurt, most of the time, hurt others. That's a fruit. If you want to know if you're walking in fear or not, how nice are you being to people, to those that you're living with, to those that are around you? Are you impatient? Are you uneasy? Are you edgy? You know, I already said that. Aren't you listening? You know, that kind of an attitude. That's fear. Fear has fruit too. See, faith cancels out fear, but fear can cancel out faith as well. So I want to just kind of give you the warning there. But the proof that we're walking in the Spirit is that we're loving our enemies, loving those around us, that we have joy, that we have peace. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's important. You can't have one without the other. It's basically vital signs that you're walking in the Spirit. Um, if a man doesn't have a pulse, but he's breathing, does that mean he's alive? The answer is yes, but probably not for long unless they get that pulse going. I don't know a whole lot about, uh, about, about medical science, but 
I can say this, if you don't have a pulse, you're not going to be breathing very long. And uh, I don't even know if that's even possible. Uh, it's possible you can have a pulse but not be breathing. I'm not sure if it's the other way around. But what I'm saying is, is you've got to have a pulse and you've got to be breathing. And it's the very same thing you've got. If you're going to be walking in the Spirit, you're going to have all of it. When I hold up an apple and I say, what's this? You're going to say, it's an apple. I'm not going to say, no, no, it's apple skin. All right. Uh, no, no, it's apple seeds. No, they, 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 it all goes together. All right, it's the fruit of the Spirit. All right, so I'm not going to go uh, any, any longer on that. But you have to have all of them. So now let me ask you, all right, do you want to love people no matter who they are? Do you want to have joy? Do you want to have peace? Do you want to have patience? Uh, do you want to be known as a gentle person, a good person? then you got to walk in the light as he is in the light, all right? I want to be these things. I want to be known as gentle. I want to be known as a good person. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't want to be a bad guy. I heard somebody say recently, I'm not exactly sure where, where it was. I was reading a book by uh, John Maxwell, I think, and he said 80% of the time, uh, the people that you think are, are, are doing wrong are most likely actually trying to do what's right, all right? Unfortunately, the, the Bible says that it's what's right in their own eyes. <laughs> you know, we need to be doing what's right according to God. Now, now let's discuss, all right, I, I, I have shown you why it's important that we walk in the light. Now I want to look at why we stray from the light, all right? Why do we stray from the light? If you don't remember anything that you heard, all right, if you don't remember anything that you heard in this message, um, I want you to remember this. Darkness is a concealer. Light is a revealer. I've basically put that phrase right in the middle of everything I've just said because it kind of clears up everything. Now, if you can't remember anything that I've already said, and you remember that darkness is a concealer, light is a revealer. I want you to write that down on a piece of paper, print it out or something, put it on your mirror or someplace, maybe on your phone as a wallpaper or something, and just let it be a constant reminder because I'm getting ready to show you why we walk out of that glorious light that gives us so many wonderful things. Why is it that we do something so ridiculous, all right? It ultimately, that the phrase that I just said, all right, and I'm going to say it again, darkness is a concealer, light is a revealer. This ultimately explains why we tend to stray from the light so much. John 3, 19 explains it like this. Men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. This is why we stray from the light so much, folks. This is why there's a conditional if clause in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Because the fact is we have to make it a point to walk in the light. There's an effort involved. Because we love darkness. Why? Why do we love darkness? I thought we liked light. I thought God created the world at the beginning of creation with light, starting with light. Why is it that we like to walk in darkness? Because our deeds are evil. Our deeds are evil. Who wouldn't want to walk in the light? Anyone who has a habit of concealing their true sinful nature are the ones who like to stray into darkness. And I hate to tell you, but the things that God hates the most are the things that we like to conceal the most. What about committing adultery? <laughs> Can I tell you something? When I get up in the morning, I do not automatically say, I think I'm going to commit adultery. We don't do that. We don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I just have the urge to kill somebody. We don't have those problems. 
we don't wake up. Now, some people, all right, who, who struggle, maybe you struggle with alcohol. There is freedom. There is, the, there is a way to be free. We have an addictions program at our church, and I encourage you to be a part of it. But, but you didn't, even if you drink, even if you struggle with alcohol, even if you struggle with smoking or drugs or whatever it might be, there wasn't a day when you weren't doing those things that you said, I think I'm going to get stone drunk today. I think I'm going to get so slobbering drunk that I wake up in jail. Or I think I'm just, I, you know, I'm going to try cocaine. I've never tried that before. I'm just going to go ahead and try it. You're never going to say, I, I, think, I, I think I'm just going to try cigarettes. Even though I've heard that it causes cancer, I, I, I think I'm just going to smoke today. We don't think that way. We look at adultery and fornication and theft and all of these things as the big, bad, black sins. And ultimately we say, well, I don't do that. And we look at these people that come walking into our church and they've got fish hooks hanging out of their noses and they've got, uh, they, they're, they're, they've, they're, they're completely covered with markings all over their bodies and you know they're they're wearing inappropriate clothing and uh you know they they just you know and 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 then on top of that they come in asking for you to pay their bills and we look at them and go what vermin and the bible tells us to beware of that because the fact is is that's not how that person started out Here's an example, all right? God hates pride. Yes, he does. What about when I go around stirring up problems for other people? God hates discord among brethren. How much discord have you stirred up in your house this week? How much discord have you stirred up with people just because you just tend to have a way of being negative, especially right now that you're cooped up in the house and there's nothing better to do but to complain and whine and groan and cause discord. What about when someone says something nasty to me and my heart begins to imagine the worst things happening to that person to make me feel better? God hates a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says this, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Can I tell you something? You don't see adultery. You don't see murder. You don't see drunkenness. You don't see homosexuality or any of those, what we like to call big black sins. When we become proud of ourselves, suddenly, as we're walking in the light, we pause and this is what happens. We look at Jesus and we go, hang on just a minute. And we walk off into the darkness to find a place to hide our pride. See, especially when you're walking with God and great things are happening, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And in the midst of that prosperity, you start to become proud. And you go, hang on a minute, Jesus, and you walk off into the darkness, and you try to find a place to hide that sin. But guess what? Psalm chapter 139 and verse 11 says this, If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. We don't have a place to hide our sin, people. So we stray and stay in the darkness, harboring our sin. Instead, we ought to stand in the light and we ought to say, I can't hide this thing anywhere. I'm guilty. I'll never forget Judson. I I, I went and named one of my kids. I shouldn't have done that. 
I can't remember if it was Judson or Harry. I, I can't remember which one of my boys did this, but I remember, you know, when you walk into a room and your kids are quiet, you know, that, that, that you know, you're like, why is everybody so quiet? Well, I think it was Judson, but he's just a baby. Judson, he, he always loved frogs and all this stuff. So since I've named him, sorry, Judd. But he always loved to get his hands on things. And I remember I came into the room. I was like, he's being awful quiet. And I remember I walked into the room and, and uh, you know, that, that guilty turn. You know, he kind of jumped up. You know, he's doing something that he's not supposed to. And when you walk in, they jump 10 feet in the air. Guilty. And I go, what's in your hand? What's in your other hand? <laughs> Let me see both of your hands. That's really how he was doing. I was like, okay, open your hand. He began to back into the corner. I began to approach him. Let's see what's in your hand, son. Let's see your hand. Open your hand up. I, I'm not going to ask you again. Let's see what's in your hand. He opens up his hand, and in his hand is a half a cockroach. And I was just like, oh, that, that's so gross. And I took that thing out of his hand, got him into the bathroom, and washed his hands off. And I mean, I'm just, oh, it's just disgusting. But he knew he wasn't supposed to be touching stuff like that. But, you know, that's kind of how we are. And the fact is, is our sin is nothing but a filthy, dead cockroach. It's nothing good. It's nothing that's going to help us. It's filled with disease. And yet we continue to conceal it because we're unwilling to say, God, I did this. I'm sorry. You know, when you say, I'm sorry to the Lord, Jesus comes up and he shows you his hands and his feet again. And he says, that's what these are for. I forgive you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I tell you something? When you ask God to forgive you of your sin, you may not feel like you're forgiven, but believe that you are. Because the fact is, is every sin you committed, past, present, and the ones you're gonna to commit tomorrow, Jesus paid for every single one of them on the cross. And that's why it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, I died for those. <laughs> yeah, let's keep walking. Come on, step back into the light. Let's go a little bit further. When you're in that light, there is nothing like it in this world. I just want you to hear this. Everybody makes mistakes. Not everybody corrects them. Everybody hears. Not everybody listens. Everybody has problems. Not everybody solves them. Everybody falls. Not everybody gets back up. Everybody receives lessons from life. Not everybody improves from them. Everybody needs to make changes. Not everybody does. I want to encourage you during these times of difficulty, search your heart. Face the bad that's coming out of you. You say, I hate this coronavirus. It's bringing out the worst in me. Can I tell you something? It's one of the greatest things that could ever happen to you, isn't it? This coronavirus is causing you to just discover some of the... We're in day 20 of the quarantine, and I'm finding some of the ugliest things about Mike Barnett. And I'm, you know what I'm finding out? I'm, I'm running into the dark. I'm like, hang on a minute, God. I just found something. And I run into the darkness, and I'm trying to find a place to hide it. But there's no darkness anywhere because God's light fills everything. And I find myself straying away from him and unwilling to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And I end up accumulating all these big, black, ugly things. Just go to God. Remember this right in the middle of everything that I had said. Darkness is a concealer. Light is a revealer. Just give it to God. Walk in the light and experience, those, that, and experience the fruit 
of the Spirit. Lord, I thank you so much for this time we can be together, and I ask that you'd be with each person and help them as they go through these hard times and hard days. We love you. Teach us as you see fit. We know you know what's best. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night.